Today's speakers will be Brigadier General Dave Hodney, Director, Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team, Brigadier General Tony Potts, Program Executive Officer, Program Executive Office Soldier, Mr. Doug Tomilio, Director, U.S. Army Nautic, Soldier Research, Development, and Engineering Center, and Dr. Donald Rigo, Director, Night Vision. Just a reminder during the question and answer portion, if you have a question, please wait until the microphone is in your hand before proceeding. At this time, let's welcome Brig Brigadier General Hodney. It's great, uh, great to be here at my second uh, AUSA in this, uh, this duty position. My name is Dave Hodney. I'm the director of the Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team, and I'm also the chief of infantry at Fort Benning, Georgia. Uh, so it's, it's, it's great to be here and, and uh, see this team out here. So a few things I'd like to highlight. Uh, a lot of progress has been achieved just in the last 12 months since the previous AUSA. In fact, there were some aspects of last year's AUSA where some would say what we were pursuing was unachievable. And I would tell you those impossibilities are on the floor here today. So I'm real, real proud of what, uh, what Army Futures Command has fielded and what uh, we've done in concert with, with our team here, because um, it's, 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 it's important work on behalf of our soldiers. So I want to start with that. Before I introduce uh, my teammates here, um, there's been no change to the goal of the Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team. We remain committed to treating the soldier and the squad as a system and uh, providing them the focus they need uh, to achieve overmatch against our near-peer adversaries. We're focused on the close combat force. The close combat force remains the same military occupational specialties we described last year. Our infantry, our cavalry scouts, our combat engineers, and their accompanying forward observers and combat medics. Uh, throughout, we collaborate with all of our Army headquarters, FORCECOM, TRADOC, SOCOM, the Marine Corps, and uh, we're working with each of those elements as we, as we continue to work on fielding capabilities for our soldiers. We've also leveraged authorities provided to us to rapidly prototype and achieve capabilities that we'd not previously seen. Uh, the Soldier Lethality Cross-Functional Team remains focused on, on a number of components of, of lethality. The first, of course, is the lethality afforded by weapons, munitions, fire control devices. That, uh, that goes without saying. The other things and, and, and kind of the implied tasks associated with lethality are our mobility. So we're very focused on soldiers' load, weight, power considerations. Communications is, is obviously critical to lethality. You're, you can't lead if you can't communicate. You can't be lethal uh, or apply lethal effects without being able to communicate to your fellow soldiers. Situational awareness, uh, your ability to leverage sensors, displays, and data that was previously unavailable to the soldier and squad at, uh, at the speed of information is really important. Protection, uh, survivability, uh, signature management, and then lastly, uh, training in human performance. Uh, you just listened to General Gervais talk from the synthetic training environment. That's certainly part of it. Uh, but there's other aspects of how we integrate systems. And Tony Potts is going to talk about adaptive soldier architecture and other things we're leveraging. They're going to increase the performance of our soldiers. And lastly, we're exploring the realm of modeling uh, squad performance and how we can evaluate readiness at levels previously, you know, you know, limited to the company and above in our, in our reporting systems. At end state, our, our end state remains the same. We're going to overcome uh, an erosion in close combat capability uh, relative to the pacing threats identified in our national defense strategy. That's really important. Uh, our signature programs remain the same that, uh, that uh, uh, you've hopefully seen in, in the press and, and uh, I briefed last year at AUSA. The first I'll brief is our enhanced night vision goggle binocular. It's the first dual-tubed image intensification and thermal uh, goggle that fuses both images in high definition. We fielded that system as Army Futures Command first material solution delivered to the force last month. And uh, certainly a proud moment for Army Futures Command and a proud moment for this entire team. Tony Potts and I joined Sergeant Major of the Army Grinston last uh, month at Fort Riley, Kansas when we delivered, delivered that capability. Uh, that capability obviously provides uh, the, the, the image intensification and thermal viewing that I described, both day and night capable. 
So for the first time, our dismounted infantry soldier is able to employ thermal, thermal sensing and thermal, uh, uh, thermal imaging in support of their daytime operations. That's something that's been common among any of our soldiers that have been on, on vehicle platforms in armor brigade or striker brigade combat teams. So it's, it's uh, fitting that we provide that capability to our rifle squads. It also, when paired with the family of weapon site individual, provides rapid target acquisition where there's this essentially an opt or a site you know fused up in the in the goggle that allows a soldier to see what's on the on the, on on his weapon scope and then when tied with the net warrior provides augmented reality which allows you know more situational awareness where our friendly uh, soldiers are located that uh, each soldier can see when uh, when using net warrior in uh, in their enhanced night vision goggle binocular the next program is our next generation squads weapon program it's a combination of an automatic rifle, a rifle, and a common cartridge to both. Uh, in August, we down-selected uh, to our three vendors, uh, General Dynamics, SIG, and Textron. Uh, they, they are obviously here on the floor, so I encourage you to go see, see the direction they're taking this program. All of that effort was informed by the 2017 Maneuver Center of Excellence-sponsored Small Arms Ammunition Configuration Study, which really shaped our approach to how we were going to uh, you know, approach weapons technology and what we need to get. It's not just about the weapon. It's about the soldier. It's about the weapon. It's about the enabler on the weapon. It's about the ammunition he uses, and it's about the training that soldier has. So it's a, it's much more complex. Um, so I'm certainly excited about where the direction we're going with uh, with the next gen squad weapon, and it includes the next generation fire control effort as well. Uh, the last program uh, is our integrated visual augmentation system. In its simplest terms, that's the transition of the enhanced night vision goggle binocular uh, analog system to a digital replication of that effort. Um, it, it's going to be a, it's, it's a leap from analog to digital, a single device that will allow us to fight, train, and rehearse. Uh, and according to former Secretary of Defense Mattis's goal was to allow soldiers to execute 25 bloodless battles through the simulation and training and rehearsal capability before they before they're uh, in, in actual combat. It's a head, heads up display. It leverages our low, low light sensors, uh, technologies, thermal cameras, and it's configured in a much wider field of view than you'd see in the traditional goggle format. Um, and uh, in the end, I would tell you that's a, uh, you know, what, what, what we would tell you would be the end user device for multi-domain operations as we realize the Army of 2028 and the Army of 35. Uh, so there's three points I want to make before I turn this over to the team. If I were to look at the 2019 in review, I would distill it down to three things. I would tell you it's about teamwork, it's about pace, and it's about common sense innovation through our soldier-centered design. So those three aspects of, uh, of our approach have, have enabled us to stay on time and deliver uh, you know, exponential capability to our soldiers. So teamwork, pace of delivery, and common sense innovation. So teamwork first. Proud to introduce uh, the team here. Uh, my wingman in the acquisition realm, uh, Program Executive Office Soldier, Brigadier General Tony Potts. He and I uh, they are you know, constant communication, and uh, I'm, I'm incredibly proud to be partnered with, uh, with Tony and his team of program managers that, uh, that are pushing these programs. We've got, uh, we, we've got two of the three labs represented here. We've got uh, our Soldier Center, uh, Mr. Doug Tamilio. Um, he's going to have an opportunity to describe what he's doing. And then uh, from the C5 ISR night vision and electronic sensor uh, directorate, we've got uh, Don Riego here as well. And John Hederick, not here from the Armament Center, certainly uh, you know, played you know, the, the critical role in uh, the Next Gen Squad Weapons Program. Uh, not here as well, our partnership with Army Test and Evaluation Command, our partner with Army Contracting Command, industry, academia, and even in, in, in no small terms uh, with the Maneuver Center of Excellence Capability Development Integration Directorate and the Commanding General here at Fort Benning. It's, it's uh, with the CFT is exactly in the right spot where I can be tied with where, where, where capabilities and requirements emerge uh, to meet our soldier needs. So that's, that's point one about teamwork. Point two about, is about pace. This time last year, right after AUSA, I was waiting on the report of the successful shoulder fire of the next gen squad weapon demonstrator. And that was, that was certainly something that uh, we were all paying close attention to. If you can't successfully shoulder fire that weapon, it delivers uh, you know, far more energy at range than, 
than the existing uh, rifle and automatic rifle. That was something we paid close attention to. And, and uh, the Textron Armament Center team effort on that system demonstrated they knocked it out of the park. We're certainly appreciative of that. And that, that got us exactly where we are today. This time last year, we also only learned of the announcement of Microsoft, a non-traditional partner, as the, uh, you know, uh, receiving the award for our integrated visual augmentation system. We've since done one uh, soldier touch point at Fort Pickett, uh, Virginia, and we're about this next month about to start the second uh, soldier touch point at Fort Pickett, executing platoon level operations, leveraging that waveguide technology and the integrated tactical network. It's really exciting stuff. And next July, we'll test the first ruggedized military form factor of that in company level operations, uh, which is a pretty essential, essential portion of that. With our ENVGB, 22 months from the Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, then Vice Chief of Staff of the Army, General McConville, approving the requirement to Army Futures Command delivering that capability to soldiers at Fort Riley, Kansas. That's a record time, less than two years. And I would tell you that, uh, some, again, I'm going to echo, some said that these milestones were unachievable. And there was, you know, you can't wring your hands and roll your sleeves at the same time. This team rolls their sleeves and, and is focused on delivering capability. Our partnership with industry um, is, uh, is something I'm particularly proud of. They appreciate that we outline our requirements in a manner that allows them to innovate. And that's, that's, that's important to them. They also appreciate, and I appreciate, that both sides of the fence stay on schedule. And there's no better way to you know, in, ensure trust and ensure uh, delivery by, uh, by doing that. And the last thing I'll talk about is, uh, before I hand it over to uh, Brigadier General Potts, is what I described as common sense innovation. Uh, the secret sauce of our approach has been soldier-centered design. So with every one of our programs, from the ENVGB, the first, you know, you know, when the first time our vendor provided the ENVGB to soldiers, we've done 11 soldier touch points, and that system changed over time. Soldiers provide that common sense feedback, and they're not ashamed to provide any feedback on what they don't like about the system or what they love about the system. And when we hear those, those comments, it's very helpful for us to make sure we get it right. Uh, we've had throughout our soldier touch points, we've had uh, units from U.S. Army Forces Command, we've had units from U.S. Army Special Operations Command, and we've had the Marine Corps supporting us throughout, throughout this endeavor. Uh, with our integrated visual augmentation system, we've had over 5,000 hours of soldier feedback informing the direction we're taking with that program. Uh, we've got uh, routinely soldiers executing three-week sprints at the Microsoft facility in Redmond, and uh, their, their data collection on that has been integral to informing where we're going. And we're almost at uh, 4,900 hours of soldier feedback on the next-gen squad weapons program. Even inside just over a month after the down select to the three vendors that were uh, pressing forward, We've already had another soldier touch point uh, with, that uh, provided those vendors detailed feedback uh, on the direction of each of those particular systems. So uh, I'm going to pass it off. Again, this is a team effort. Uh, nothing the CFT does happens solely by the efforts of the CFT. Everything we do is the integrated effort of a synchronized group of team. And again, only about half of the agencies or less than half of the agencies are represented here on this table. So I'll turn it over to Tony Potts. Hey, thanks, Dave. So again, I'm, I'm Tony Potts. I'm the Program Executive Officer for Soldier. Uh, we, we're obviously talking about four of our significant and signature programs that are part of the 31. Uh, there's probably about 137 programs uh, at Soldier. So it, it is a concerted effort. Uh, it's, it's a great, uh, Dave is not only a great partner as far as a CFT, but as the Chief of Infantry. It continues to help us across the board. You know, see other partners here like Don Sando uh, from the MCO uh, that allows us to bring all this together. And one of the things um, I think Dave mentioned earlier that I, I just want to focus on really two major points. One of them is uh, this whole idea of the adaptive squad architecture. And I say that as the material developer because I think it's the cornerstone and the key to the things that we are doing today that are different than the things that we've done in the past. So the way we talk about it is we talk about the soldier as an integrated weapons platform and the squad as an integrated combat platform. And that's important. And it's important because when you're looking at the squad, the total lethality of a squad 
versus the individual, the capability of an individual system. That begins to change your trade space. And so what it allows us to do is maximize squad level cap capability. Where I would tell you that years past, as a, as a PM, whether it was at the 05 level or the 6 level, we were really focused on um, the JSEDS level requirements. And right, as long as I hit those JSEDS level requirements, I could declare victory, right? Hit cost, schedule, performance, I delivered it. That was great. Then we started having soldiers take a look at it. What happens today is, uh, in partnership with the CFT, and really looking at those requirements and concepts, is the ability to bring it in and look at it across the board as a squad and how all of those capabilities or all of those systems integrate together to create an overarching capability. Uh, one of the, I think one of the lessons we learned out of this, and just, and I use this as an example, is um, distance was always king uh, when we talk about night vision and night vision sensors. So when we went after the individual or the integrated visual augmentation system, we were also going after how far can you see? How far can you see drives, just the physics of it, drives the size of the aperture. But we were convinced that was the right thing for us to do. We've always gone after distance. We were talking about soldiers and about what it does to the aperture and the size. They didn't particularly care for some of the size that we were looking at. And we said, well, unfortunately, to get you the distance, it's going to be about this big. And they, the soldiers in these touch points that Dave's talking about came back and said, why do you think I need that much distance? And we said, well, that's what we give you. We give you distance. And they said, I don't care about the distance. What I care about is field of view. I need a wider field of view so that I have better situational awareness. I can see around me. And by the way, if you're going to put a synthetic training capability in here, I need to see my world larger so that I get full uh, capability, cognitive capability of those type of synthetic training we walked into. That's very interesting. So we said, oh, okay, that's interesting. And so Dave and I got to talking about it about how do you change this thing, but yet how do we maintain some of the capability to distance because we still want to target a distance? Well, then we have this system called Family of Weapon Sites Individual, which will see thermally out to 900 meters. And so we said, well, you know, when we combine these capabilities through an ISW, we can actually bring that targeting site into the soldier's field of view in an 18 degree field of view overlaid and either in picture in picture, and the soldier can still see targeting data out to 900 meters, yet we can, we can change the size of the aperture, we can make it smaller, we can then make the device smaller, we can give him a larger field of view, and we can still give the soldier distance. Now, if you're only doing one product at a time, that type of discussion never takes place. It is only through the design to an adaptive squad architecture where we are really defining with industry or with our industry partners, and we've had a couple ASA meetings, and the ASA is about um, all the ICDs, the electrical, the mechanical, the physical. It's also about the software, having software development kits, so that with our industry partners, what we are creating is an ecosystem. Now here's what changes. What changes is what uh, I like to refer to as capability in the white space. And what that really means is I can lay out on a piece of paper and I can show you, here's what an ENVGB can do. Here are all of its attributes. And if I give that to a soldier in and of itself, it is one of the greatest capabilities that we've ever given to our soldiers. I can lay out an FWSI and I can say, this is the attributes. And giving it to the soldier still gives them a greater capability than they've ever had on that weapon system. But now, and I can do that for other things. I can look at our soldier-borne sensors and I can say, now we've got a platoon level ISR. And in a platoon level ISR, I've got one person that controls it and I've got one person that sees the feed, but I still have platoon level ISR. Now what happens when I tie all that together with an architecture where I can share the data, where I understand how to pass power, where I understand how to do all these things? I can now take the white space in between those products and suddenly I have a thing called rapid target acquisition to where I can bring I can bring the targeting data from an FWSI into the visual picture of an ENVGB, and now we've given a soldier rapid target acquisition. A soldier actually no longer really needs to shoulder his weapon to be able to have excellent targeting data. You don't get that unless you do some type of an architecture and you really look at the squad as an integrated combat platform. 
now we can start making trades. And if we all build, if our industry partners are building with us to this adaptive squad architecture, the answer is going to be there is going to be a lot of capability in the white space. And it's going to be capability that's not a pr named program of record. It is going to be a, a capability that is derived by putting an architecture together and sharing this whole entire digital architecture across a squad. And we're finding that's going to make us powerful. Now imagine now this, now this small uh, UAS that flies, if I no longer have to have one controller, if I can now control it because I'm using a singular type software in a processor, and I can tell it where to go, I can tell it what to look at, and then I can bring that back into any of my sensors, whether it's an ENVGB or whether it's an IVAS, I can now share squad level ISR across an entire squad without creating another program in the Army to try to hook all this stuff together. That's what's going to make us far more powerful. That's going, what's going to make the dollars. And by the, by the way, with, with us doing that, we the government owning that adaptive squad architecture, that, that infrastructure and that architecture what we will do, I believe, for our companies and our partners out there is, we're going to free up your resources. I don't need you to build that infrastructure. I don't need you to build the architecture. What I need you to build is the capability that will reside within that infrastructure and architecture. So instead of spending 60, 70% of your dollars building infrastructure and architecture and 40% building capability, spend the bulk of your money building us capability. We will be powerful together doing that. Last thing I'll talk about to bring this in is our soldier integration facility. We are in the process of standing our, our SIF up. The SIF is part of an ecosystem that goes from, it is our close combat squad ecosystem. So on, and Doug, Doug Tomelio on his side, um, they, they'll, they're standing up their sprint facility. Uh, they have the mastery where we are looking at soldier performance. On the other side, Dave Hodney's got, uh, and Don Sando, um, so they've got, um, well, help me out, the Maneuver Battle Lab. So, and in the middle, we will bring in this integration facility where we are going to operationalize the technical aspects of what we do. And collectively, it's a continuum across the ecosystem that we will work to evaluate requirements, operational concepts, and make sure we get it right before we start to actually develop the program. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Doug Tabilio, my battle buddy. Thank you, Tony. Hey, so um, I want to thank Dave Hodney for inviting us up here today, because it is about the team, and uh, that doesn't happen often. And so um, I run the Soldier Center up at Natick, headquartered at Natick, Mass. For those who were here for the last briefing for Steve, you saw Matt Clark. Matt works for me down in Orlando. So you can see there's a good integration and synergy between the two that he mentioned earlier. But I want to mention the Soldier Lethality S&T team that I think is important because it's not just the Soldier Center and it's not just C5 ISR. My good friend back there, Dr. Picante, who I saw uh, slide in. So Phil runs, obviously, the Army Research Lab, but that research is the underpinnings for everything that I do and, and what they do over in Night Vision and what John Hedrick does. So hats off to uh, the night, excuse me, to Phil. They don't get the credit they deserve half the time for the basic research, research that they do. So. Um, we also have John Hederick at the Armament Center. John couldn't be here today, so I'm going to fill in for John a little bit. So if I'm off on weapons, you can, uh, you can talk to John about that. And then uh, Don's going to talk uh, as part of C5 ISR, and he's going to talk about the situational awareness. So uh, if you paid attention, he was talking about um, the LOEs that we support. One of the accomplishments that happened in the last couple of years that I'm, I think has really focused the S&T work is an ICD for soldier lethality. And so uh, that's been a long time coming. Uh, and we've broken that down into six LOEs that we're kind of bucketing our S&T under. I'm going to talk five of those. Don's going to talk one. So I'm going to start off with lethality. And this is really John Hederick's uh, uh, area. But the significant accomplishment that can't be overlooked here is the next generation squad weapons technology. Not just the actual weapon, but the technology that came with that. That technology has been working for a long time. Back when I was a PM of Soldier Weapons a long time ago, we were still dealing with some of that technology. But they actually brought that to bear, which is huge for our Army, because that's going to enable industry, and it really sets the pace for what we want out of these weapons. Uh, with that, though, you've got to have the ammunition. Uh, and so the projectile, the lethal mechanism, that's been uh, transferred over, the general purpose round anyways. Another significant accomplishment has been the, um, we are at TR level five for the fire control because I think you mentioned earlier that having the weapon system of itself is great, 
but if you can't hit the target down range first round, it's probably insignificant, right? You need that capability, and that's really going to take that weapon system where the capability is going to have and the lethality up to another notch. The other thing that we're doing is barrel life technologies. We're trying to increase the barrel life of some of these weapons. We know they're going to go through probably barrels quicker than we used to see. And of course, suppression technologies, uh, very important. Next thing I'll talk about is uh, LOE's training in human performance. So one of our flagship programs is Mastery. And so this program is all about really providing our squad leaders, platoon leaders, company commanders at the lower echelon level, uh, both cognitive and physical status of their soldiers at any time. And we've come a long way with that. This is a OSD uh, plus up program. Uh, and in conjunction with ARL and uh, other partners, uh, we've developed, uh, we're going to develop, I should say, a suite of sensors that will be uh, on a soldier uh, that will work within the cloud environment. We're working closely with uh, PM uh, IVAS because they've got that capability that we think we can lock into. And that information, as well as medical command information, will be the push up from the squ individual soldier to the squad leader to the platoon leader to get a status of that squad at any given time. I think that's always going to give us increased capability in training, uh, but also in combat operations. Okay, uh, mobility, another area that we're focused on. So really there's two main focus areas here. One is uh, physical augmentation. You know it as exoskeletons. If you go around the corner, Lockheed Martin has a couple out there they're demonstrating. So what we've done in exoskeletons is we've, we've asked industry to provide the best uh, that they have out there today. And we've taken them and we talked about soldier touch points. We've done five major touch points with the 10th Mountain Division. We've got hundreds of hours of data from those soldiers on what they like and what they dislike, uh, don't like. And so what we're finding is that the technology is close, but we're not there yet. We still have to focus on really two key aspects. What's is mobility for our infantry soldiers, but it can't be overburdening and it can't weigh too much, or they won't be able to carry it when they get to the next point. And the other is the physical load, this heavy weight. I talked about it last year when I briefed. The ability of a 7-7 crew to lift a 98-pound projectile all day long, uh, that's kind of a hard task. And so we're looking at passive and, and uh, ways they could do that. So we're going to have, for industry here, we're going to have a, an industry call here shortly for our next iteration of that. Uh, in survivability, uh, we have developed uh, a processing. We didn't develop the material, but we developed a processing mold, if you will, to allow uh, this material to be molded into a helmet form that we have transitioned over to PEO Soldier for their IHIPS program. This reduces the weight of the helmet, current helmet, by 40%, and that's a significant achievement for our soldiers. On top of that, for just body armor torso protection, so we've been mandated by Congress to reduce torso weight by 20%, and I'm happy to say that this year we believe we're going to be at 24% on a reduction. And again, that didn't come alone. That came from ARL, materials research, and it came at work that we've done up at Natick. Um, I, I forgot one other thing. Let me backtrack for mobility. I apologize. One of the other key er uh, areas of mobility that we're focused on is uh, squad precision aerial resupply. And so many of you are familiar with our J-PADS program. That's a heavy precision airdrop, 4,000 pounds and up. We've got a joint ACTD that we're working with the other services to deliver 100 to 500 pound uh, packages of resupply uh, in complex terrain. So you can read that as cities or other areas. Uh, that's testing out. Uh, it's, it's doing awesome right now in test. Uh, that should be fielded probably within the next year. I think that program actually ends this fiscal year. So that'll be transitioned. Uh, and we've got some other new starts I'm going to talk to General Hodney about in our review next week that we're looking at within that area. Uh, and finally, for protection. So right now our enemies have, uh, have got a unique ability to detect our soldiers from distance. And so a lot of this work is classified, but we're working on how do we take the current uh, uniform protection levels and increase that significantly so we can hide in all different environments, uh, in all different spectrums. Uh, that work is going on. We're pretty proud of that. And the other part of that, too, is to protect our soldiers against environmental threats, whether that's cold, heat, uh, flame, and all that stuff. So that's kind of the major areas that they're working on. And I'm going to turn it over to my friend Don Riego. Oh, thank you, Doug. As, as uh, Doug said, uh, I'm part of the C5 ISR Center, and we're part of the engineering and science team that supports uh, the CFT and PEO soldier. And as a laboratory, uh, we do both uh, science and technology, so the new cool stuff, but also provide the engineering support for things like IVAS, the MVGB, and the soldier integration facility that General Hodney and Potts uh, discussed earlier. So I, what I thought I would do is just cover a few 
uh, groundbreaking areas we're working in. Uh, since this is year in review, things we've done this last year give you some flavor for the work we're doing to support so, uh, situation awareness and lethality. So the first effort is uh, called the Digital Squad, which is really about how new information technologies can work within the IVAS to enable our squads. Uh, this includes work from the Soldier Center, ourselves, C5ISR, Army Research Lab, and the Corps of Engineers. And some of the work we did this year was hosting a new augmented reality software into the TAC, the, uh, the Army's uh, information system, which is sort of the foundation of augmented reality. We experimented with taking vi uh, vehicle video and providing it into an IVAS-like system so that you could interact, the soldiers could interact with the vehicle, uh, did, uh, showed the ability to navigate with GPS denial and looked at things like uh, how do you navigate uh, uh, without GPS when using, say, uh, laser radar data. Uh, in the lethality area, we uh, have developed a new uh, digital weapon site, uh, started a new program called the Lethality Smart Sensor, which is really the first fully digital uh, uh, weapon site designed to fit with the IVAS concept. Uh, this system provides new levels of uh, information to the soldier, but it also will continue to reduce the size, weight, power, and cost, and improve performance. Uh, and for the first time with LSS, we're sort of enhancing the understanding of the red picture uh, in situation awareness, as well as providing that weapon site capability. Uh, moving on, uh, components. So what I talked about now are, are experimental prototypes. We have uh, system developments, but also we develop new families of components with industry to improve performance. And the one I want to highlight for this year is new efforts in low light level, digital low light level sensors. Uh, we need to continue to refine and improve the state of the art in digital low light level sensors. So we started two efforts, one uh, groundbreaking research in this area, and then a second effort which is a manufacturing technology to make the existing low light level sensors in IVAS more affordable and uh, uh, smaller and more compact. And another I item I wanted to highlight is um, uh, we're beginning to look at uh, s small unit manned on man teaming. How can you know, now that we have this information environment, how can we bring other assets, man unman teaming assets, for, to flesh out that situation awareness picture to empower our squads uh, to act? Uh, and then the final thing I, I want to draw from part of another part of our C5 ISR center is the development of a new silicon anode battery. Uh, everything I talked about up till now has got electronics in it. Electronics use power. So even though we're managing the load side of the power, it's always nice to improve the ability to uh, provide power. So the silicon anode battery work is improving the power density uh, in, in a safe and conformal format that will allow uh, soldiers to have that additional power they need to uh, work in this digital environment. So that gives you some flavor of the types of work we've done this last year to support the CFT. And uh, now I want to turn it back over to General Hodney. Thanks, Don. So I really appreciated their, their insight into what the CFT has been able to, to pull together. Again, goes back to teamwork, pace of delivery, and common sense innovation throughout, the, throughout this whole process. Uh, among the things I'm particularly proud of, having been in infantry units for, for 28 years, is uh, what we're doing at the speed of what we're doing to deliver the capability to, to, the, to the soldier. Uh, by the Army of 2028, and as you know, the Secretary mentioned it yesterday in his opening comments, by the Army of 2028, the soldier lethality CFT capabilities we're pursuing right now will be part, very much part of that army. And that's, uh, that's, that's uh, something that uh, this entire team is incredibly proud of. Uh, I think we didn't consume all the time. I think we have a few minutes remaining for questions. So I'll turn it over to the floor. Oh, and, and also if we run it, there's a 1500 uh, media round table, I think for the CFT as well. Gentlemen, Ray Compton. With uh, social lethality being fast-paced and cross with uh, PNT, STE, network, and I'm using the example of IVIS, how are you addressing the risk and challenges of system integration? Oh, that's great. So, you know, thanks for cueing me on that. So the one I failed to mention as part of this team, my fellow CFT directors and their partnered program executive officers, their partnered laboratories. So. Uh, we host a board of directors specific to IVAS that certainly unpacks a lot of, a lot of other, other opportunities. So that includes the next gen combat vehicle, CFT. That includes obviously the synthetic training environment. We're partnered closely uh, at every opportunity. 
It also includes the future, future vertical lift uh, cross-functional team because of the, the potential we see in that, that, uh, that arena as well. And of course, it includes the, the network CFT, General Gallagher and Bassett uh, that are part of this. So that coordination happens routinely through, both through CFT channels within Army Futures Command and then uh, you know, crosstalk among the program executive offices and internal to the labs is, is important. Hi, Matthew Cox, military.com. Listen, thanks you guys for doing this. Um, so could you bring us up to date as far as the next generation squad weapon testing of, okay, so when you're gonna get the next generation squad fire control and so when you're gonna get all the prototypes and when soldiers are gonna start testing those both together. And also, I'm sure you're doing this, but uh, are, are, you, are you, you know, there are some soldiers that carry grenade launchers connected to their weapons. You know, is that involved in the testing? And what kind of, have you, have you done that already? And if, is that, you know, you gotten any feedback on that as, how, as far as how it affects the ergonomics of these weapons? Hi, Matt, how are you doing today? I'm good, how are you? <laughs> I think that was 10 questions Sorry, is, Sorry. is what that, that, that was. We don't get you guys um, that often. And so, hey, so, Matt, what we'll do for the most of that, why, why don't we, uh, I'll bring that, let's do that at the press conference this afternoon. I don't know if you're, you're going to be able to be there. I'll talk because it, it's a long explanation. So let's, so what we had to do with, with all of the vendors, right, is demonstrated that they, they meet the threshold of capability that we need in the weapon systems as described by the CFT. So we know that all vendors uh, that have been selected to move forward meet those thresholds. We are also testing out because we use uh, a smart rail system on there that all the systems that, that a soldier needs to utilize, that they utilize today, that we have the capability to utilize those systems on our next generation weapons. Um, we're like, you know, like General Hadi mentioned, last week we were doing, uh, we were firing the weapons. Uh, so we're, we're already firing the prototype weapons. Um, in November, I believe, is when, and I know I saw my team over here, Jason, I, got, I got Jason Bohan, I got Art sitting over here, uh, and so November, uh, is that when we're bringing in uh, next generation fire control? Proposals, so the proposals for the next generation fire control are due in in November, and so you got the smart guys sitting over here uh, over my shoulder that'll, you know, and then we'll bring all that together. I think we actually start doing some testing in April with uh, weapons. Yeah, so I have to look at them and they have to nod their heads so that I make sure that I'm answering right for the weapons. For the fire control, so, so the question that he asked was, when, were, when are we supposed to get the prototypes for the fire control? And I'm going to look back at my team again. So they're telling me January. That was what the answer I got was. And we'll, we'll marry up the weapons and the fire control and then we'll go into testing in April. All right, great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.